Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum. Please excuse the voice, I'm getting over a bit of a head cold here. But today we are going to take a look at a Beretta AR-70-90. This is the improved pattern, as the name implies, of the Beretta AR-70. And well, I have a previous video on the AR-70 itself, so we'll skip the developmental story of that one. I'll link to it at the end of this video in case you're interested. But the important thing to note is that the, the Italian army adopted the AR-70, but they didn't adopt it for everybody. It essentially only went to elite special units, and the majority of the Italian army continued to use the BM-59 in 7.62 NATO. Now this would last until the 1980s. So in 1970, NATO decides that it needs to standardize on a new cartridge. Uh, the US is now, by that point, uh, equipping its forces in Europe with M16 rifles. They're in 5.56, the NATO standard cartridge is 7.62. This isn't good, this isn't going to work. But it takes NATO a full 10 years to finally finish all of its testing and standardize on 5.56. Now it's not the American 5.56, it's the Belgian M855 ammunition, or Belgian SS109, adopted by the US as M855. And this would have some problems for a bunch of countries, including the US and also Italy. Uh, primarily, that new standardized cartridge was a 62 grain bullet that required a 1 in 7, or maybe 1 in 9, twist to properly stabilize. The AR-70 and the original M16s used 1 in 12 inch twist barrels, which didn't adequately stabilize that new ammunition. They were designed for 55 grain uh, ammunition. And so both countries would have to retrofit their guns or come up with new rifles. That's where the M16A2 comes from in the US, and Beretta in the early 1980s began to put together an improvement package or an upgraded version of the Beretta AR-70 to accommodate this new ammunition change as well as make a bunch of other improvements to the gun. So this was first presented to the Italian military in 1985. It would go through a bunch of testing competitive testing as well as endurance and field trials testing on its own. There were two other competitors for the new Italian army rifle at this point, uh, although neither of them were, dis you know, were distinctly Italian designs. The Bernardelli company showed up with a copy of the Galil, and the Funky company showed up with, it's unclear if it's a copy or if it was a straight, just licensed production version of the H&K G41, which was essentially the HK-33 using M16 magazines. Now, the AR-7090 would win the competition so uh, and, and be adopted in 1990, as the name implies. Let's go ahead and take a look at what they did to it. There's some distinctive features on here, like this odd carry handle, and some clever ones like the gas block. In putting together the AR-7090 platform, Beretta changed almost everything about the AR-70, with the exception of its fundamental mechanical system. The most important single change that they made was that of the magazine. The AR-70 uses a proprietary uh, nose-in rock-back magazine, and that was changed to the standard AR-15 M16 magazine, because uh, it's clear that that's what all these NATO rifles were using. Now this is an American-made one, uh, aluminum. Beretta did of course make their own magazines for these because they were going to be supplying them to the Italian army. The Beretta ones are actually steel, kind of like HK's 416 magazines. This carry handle is a very distinctive element with that forward sweep to it, and it's a little bit odd because it's a detachable carry handle, and carry handles don't really seem like the most useful, necessary elements. Well, this in particular was developed as a short-range rapid sighting system in addition to just being a carry handle. So it basically has a set of pistol sights. We've got a pair of dots on either side of an open notch back here, and a front post with its own white dot up front. And the idea is uh, you can line those up for rapid close-range shooting. Now this carry handle is drilled through here front and back so that you can use your standard aperture iron sights. There's a 250 meter and a 400 meter aperture sight there. You can use them through this carry handle, but in my opinion not that well. Um, you get a really claustrophobic sort of sight picture trying to sight through this. It's really easy to mess up and like look over the top of the aperture and see this as your rear aperture. I frankly don't like the carry handle. And so I find it rather convenient that we can push this button here, push the whole thing back, and just take the carry handle assembly off. So there's the, 
There's the tunnel through it. There's your carry handle sights. I don't like this thing. That carry handle mounts, by the way, on a little trapezoidal bracket up here, and a locking lug at the back. And this is intended to be an optics mount. So they did make a like a basic fixed four power optic for this, which was pretty much completely obsolete by the time it was even introduced. So much more commonly they have a Picatinny rail that sits on this style of mounting block so that you can mount modern optics on the thing. Um, originally that was also intended for use with a night vision optic that fits proprietary onto this mount. So that's the purpose of those mounting blocks. The carry handle is sort of an afterthought. Both the AR70 and the 7090 have built-in folding bipods. I like this sort of feature. Uh, the downside to this one is that the bipod is mounted directly on the barrel, it is not free floated. So if you try and put a lot of pressure on this bipod you will absolutely deflect the barrel and you'll lose your, your zero at long-ish range. But I still like having it on there. Both the 70 and the 7090 are also set up to launch rifle grenades. So this is our 22mm NATO standard rifle grenade muzzle device. This is a gas cutoff. When you lift it up you've got this nice obvious hood over the front sight. That cuts off your gas so that uh, you're not battering the bolt carrier when you fire rifle grenades. What the 7090 adds to the system however is a two position gas regulator which was not on the original AR70. So the way this thing works this is open, this is closed. Closed gives you more gas. And if we look in up close here there are a series of vent holes around the diameter of this gas piston. These are the excess gas vents. So once the piston moves this far whatever remaining gas is in there is vented out here to control the overall velocity of the piston. There is then one hole up here at the front and when I have this set in the open position that hole is open and it will vent additional gas uh, before the piston starts moving. When I change it to closed that hole is shut off. So essentially closed is the dirty or adverse or higher gas setting. Open is intended to be the standard use. This by the way was not developed around suppressors. This was just regular rifle and very dirty rifle. Most of the controls on the 7090 are ambidextrous which is pretty cool. We have a four position regulator here. So this was originally safe, semi-auto, three round burst, and full auto. This one of course is semi-auto only so those extra two positions don't actually do anything. But we have a lever there and on the left side and that's got a nice big thumb pad on it that's pretty easy to manipulate. A little, little harder when you get all the way around to full but for a rifle like this that's just semi-auto um, pretty easy to go from safe to semi. Standard magazine release right there and it is a not particularly easy to use but it is an ambidextrous uh, magazine release over on this side. Fortunately for me I'm left-handed and so this one which is the easier one to use is the one I'll be using. A few of the other changes include the use of a rubber butt pad instead of metal as on the AR70. The profile of the pistol grip was changed a bit. There's still compartment, a storage compartment in the base here that's nice and easy to get into. You can keep whatever you want in there. There is a folding trigger guard for winter trigger use with gloves. That has a little spring-loaded pin there. Push that pin in, you can fold the trigger guard down. It's got this little detent that more or less snaps into the pistol grip there. So now you can fire this with heavy gloves or mittens. The receiver profile changed to sort of a trapezoidal shape instead of being a bit more square on the AR-70. And the handguard here is different than what you typically see on the AR-70, but this is actually an upgraded handguard that was designed by Beretta originally for the AR-70 in 1983. Um, retrofitted onto some of the early guns and then used on the 7090. Quick look at the markings before we take it apart. Beretta AR-7090 caliber, 5.56 NATO there. Back here we have the serial number and the manufacturer markings uh, from the guys at Brimstone who made this for me. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And on the other side a made in Italy Pietro Beretta mark. Now a disassembly starts with a pair of pins just like an AR more or less. Pop that pin out and it is captive and we can pivot the receiver open. The front pin is held in place by a little wire clip. I'm just going to leave that one in because there's not a whole lot for us to do in here. 
Um, the fire control group is rather different than the original ones because it has had the burst and full auto mechanisms removed to be a legal semi-auto in the US. There was a carbine version of this, just like there was of the AR-70 that used a uh, two-tube side-folding stock, but this is the standard infantry model. The recoil spring for the AR-7090 is, like the 70, located in the gas piston above the barrel. So to remove the bolt, I actually have to remove the charging handle which locks the bolt carrier to the recoil spring assembly, and I can do that by pulling back on this little tab. This is intended to be done with the nose of a cartridge, but I've got a nice set of pliers here to do it, so you pull that back, and then the bolt handle comes out, and then I can pull the bolt carrier out the back of the receiver. There's our bolt carrier. We've got a two lug rotating bolt here. That's locked position. That's the unlocked. We just pull it out. Note that the firing pin is actually connected to the bolt carrier. It is held in place by this cross pin right up there. So if I want to take that out, I have to push out that cross pin. Once again, the nose of a cartridge is an ideal tool for this if you don't have pliers. So pull out that pin. That is not captive. That's going to be easily lost. Not something you would necessarily have to do very often in the field. So there's the firing pin. There is no firing pin spring in this. You can see we have Beretta uh, NATO stock number parts on some of these components. Next up, I can actually just pull off the whole gas block assembly, like so. So we've got the gas port in there, the cutoff, all of that hardware comes off. The bipod assembly has this spring loaded arm on it, and to take the bipod off, all I have to do is lift up this and squeeze the two legs of the bipod together, like so, and it just opens up. So this is a pinch sort of mechanism. So it locks in the open position and I can pinch it closed. So you can take this off if you just don't want to have it on the rifle. Really a, a cool system there. Next, we'll take the handguard off. This is very simple. It just has a metal spring clip up here. So you snap that over the gas tube and the barrel, and it just slides off the bottom. There's a little sheet metal hook there that locks around this cross pin. That's actually the cross pin that holds the lower onto the upper. Next, I can take off the gas tube, which is just friction fit in place. So that comes off. And then to take out the recoil spring, I have to push it in slightly, rotate it 180 degrees, and lift it out. It has this locator pin that locks it in place. So it's normally like this. You would push it in, rotate it so the pin's up, and then it will slide out of the receiver. Go ahead and take the lower completely off. Uh, if we take a closer look at the upper here, it does have a sliding spring-loaded dust cover up here. So that's just going to reciprocate backward behind the bolt handle. Let's see it right in there. This is a stamped sheet metal upper that has a milled trunnion riveted in the back and a milled trunnion riveted into the front. You can see our locking lugs, locking shoulders right there. One of them, the other one will be on this side. The barrel is held in place by this barrel nut. Uh, really a pretty simple design and a pretty reliable one. And there is the whole thing field stripped out for you, one Beretta AR-7090. Once this was adopted in 1990, it did become the standard Italian army rifle, replacing the BM-59 in service. And tens of thousands of them were manufactured. They remained the standard service rifle for about 20 years until circa 2010, 2008 or 2010, I'm not sure on the exact date, uh, the Beretta ARX-160 was adopted to replace these guys. So these were extremely rare guns in the United States for a very long time, well pretty much until just a couple of years ago. There were semi-automatic factory versions of these made by Beretta, but they were never exported to the US because they post-dated the various bans on importation of rifles like this. So there are some pre-ban AR-70s floating around the US, which are very cool and tremendously expensive. 
but a couple of years ago parts kits for these started to show up. A relatively limited number. Uh, I grabbed one because I knew it was a cool rare rifle. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do it with it at the time, but uh, shortly thereafter I ran across Brimstone Arms in New Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and they built this one up for me as an American-made semi-automatic only copy. Uh, basically made a new receiver for it, assembled the parts kits onto that. They did that uh, relatively small numbers for me and some other people. I know there are other companies out there who also did the same thing when the parts kit showed up that provided the incentive for people to figure out how to make the receivers, for people to make the barrels, and uh, make these into complete guns. So a big thanks to Brimstone. Uh, they didn't give me this rifle, I paid for the the build process and all the parts in it, but I really appreciate them taking on the project. So uh, this coming weekend I'm going to go ahead and use this along with the Bernardelli P018S that we took a look at uh, in our previous video this week. I'm going to use both of those in a two-gun match, see how the how the Italians do in the desert on the clock. So stick around for that video, it should be a lot of fun. Thanks for watching.